is European public support for Ukraine faltering? Angry farmers in Poland and elsewhere are protesting against cheap imports from the war-torn country. And governments are under pressure to take action. So what does this mean for Ukraine as the war with Russia enters its third year? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Jonah Hull. The European Union's been one of Ukraine's biggest backers in its fight against Russia. Among the many ways it's given support is by reducing tariffs on Ukrainian agri agricultural imports. But now European farmers are pushing back. They say their livelihoods are being undermined by foreign competition and they want trade barriers reimposed. Is this part of a bigger backlash and can European leaders ease discontent while maintaining their support for Ukraine? We'll go to our panel in just a few moments, but first, Fintan Monaghan has this report. Farmers in Poland are angry, and they're not the only ones. Protests have been taking place in many parts of Europe. EU regulations are part of what's stirring the unrest. But for many, the biggest issue is cheaper food imports from Ukraine that they say are undercutting their business. Ukrainian grain is flooding Poland and we're getting poorer and poorer. We don't know what to do with our products anymore. This is our pain. I want the government to take concrete decisions. We want actions. I want the government to understand and help us financially or to export this grain from Ukraine to countries in Africa, for example. When Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, the European Union stepped in to help. It dropped tariffs on agricultural imports, providing an economic lifeline to the Ukrainian economy. Since then, Europe has also provided more than $140 billion in aid and taken in millions of refugees. But two years on, a backlash appears to be brewing. With the war now entering its third year, the farmers want tariffs reimposed. Poland's prime minister has acknowledged their concerns, but tried to redirect their anger toward Russia. It is not solely a problem of grain and food imports from Ukraine. Few people realize that our market in Europe and in Poland is being destabilized by products coming from Russia and Belarus. So we need to take all possible measures to stop that. The EU is going some way to meet the farmers' concerns. A plan to extend a free trade arrangement with Ukraine until 2025 will now allow emergency measures if market distortions become too great. And leaders are promising tariffs on Russia and Belarus that they say will help stabilize prices. But it's unclear whether that's enough to reduce the discontent and prevent a bigger backlash against support for Ukraine. Vincent Monahan, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. We're going to focus on the political implications of this story with our panellists from across Western Europe. In Warsaw, Alexandra Rubinska is a journalist and commentator. As her Twitter or X profile has it, she's unravelling Western Europe. In Kyiv, Timofey Milovanov is president of the Kyiv School of Economics and former Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture. And joining us from Brussels is Suzanne Lynch, associate editor with Politico. Great to have you all here with us. And let's begin, Alexandra Rubinska, with you. As Ukraine increasingly struggles to hold the line in the east against Russia, across the border with Poland in the west, it's essentially battling another front now. Uh, among its closest allies within the European Union, Polish farmers are angry. Are they right, do you think, to be reacting in this way, to be venting their anger at Ukraine in this way? Well, I think the Polish farmers have the impression that they are unfairly carrying the cost of the conflict in Ukraine. I think most Polish farmers have nothing against helping Ukraine at all. And the few people that appear at those farmers' protests um, that, you know, have any kind of pro-Russian uh, things to say are a very, very small minority. The farmers are angry because um, they consider um, that the European Union, meaning, of course, the European Commission, by prolonging this access of uh, Ukraine to the common market, to the European market, um, have hurt farmers, especially in Poland. There are 
There's the European Green Deal that is also connected to that. I mean, there's so much that is being asked of farmers in the EU, meaning environmental uh, regulation and rules, um, food security. And on the one hand, farmers are pressured to uh, comply with all these regulations. On the other hand, the European Union has no issue with letting um, Ukrainian grain, often technical grain, Ukrainian sugar that do not conform to EU regulations, also to food safety. Uh, they let it stream in uncontrollably. So farmers are angry about that. They're angry mm. at Brussels, they're angry at the Polish government, first and foremost, before they're angry at Ukraine. So what they're asking for is an embargo on Ukrainian imports or exports from Ukraine. Um, they ask that the transit of Ukrainian grains or agricultural products is, um, well, secured in a way that the grain is really going to the ports and then transported further away to Africa, right. wherever the Colombians of Ukraine are, uh, instead of being offloaded onto the Polish market. So this okay. is, I think, the background a little bit of this conflict. OK, well, T Timofey Milovanov, I mean, that seems like a distinctly reasonable position for Polish farmers to take. Do you think Ukraine is right to expect to be able to sell, send its produce across the border into Poland and other EU countries, knowing that a, 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 a portion of it is offloaded into local markets, undercu undercutting local producers? So what's difficult for us in Ukraine to understand is why... Uh, farmers are protesting, Ukrainian imports are not protesting Russian imports, which are going through Belarus. There have been a recent investigation by journalists who have shown that at least three companies in Poland are buying a Russian uh, grain, Russian uh, agricultural goods, and there are no protests at the border with Belarus. So that's one conflicting report. Another one, there have been protests, uh, small but nonetheless, at the Lithuanian border, arguing that Ukrainian grain somehow gets to Lithuania through Belarus or through Russia, and then gets exported back to Poland from there, which is absolutely not true. And then, of course, uh, another aspect is how much of the grain gets in transit through Poland and how much of the grain stays in Poland. And I think the numbers are not public, and this is a little bit a difficult discussion because no one is willing to talk facts. So I think there is a lot of misinformation Mm. And there is a, it has become a very political issue. And Ukraine does feel that we are being unfairly punished. Well, that issue of, of, of agricultural produce coming in from uh, Belarus from Russia is something that Donald Tusk, the uh, po Polish Prime Minister, has raised. Suzanne Lynch, I want to move on to you. Uh, what is the European Union's role in... Well, the Commission's role in all of this? Back in 1922... Uh, <laughs> 2022, they lifted quotas and tariffs at the beginning of the war to help Ukraine shift their agricultural produce, also to try and protect and preserve global food security. Since then, they've sat back and watched this situation disintegrate unable or unwilling to properly come up with a solution. Is this a mess of the EU's making and is it the EU's job to fix it? I think the EU does have a responsibility here. It, as you say, it had temporarily lifted uh, restrictions on some imports and again is going to do so for another year. Um, it's deciding that at the moment and it has got buy-in for that with some exceptions. Now, Ukraine has always had certain free trade arrangements with the EU stretching back some years. Uh, it's obviously not a member of the EU, but it had a, a relationship with the EU which allowed it to access markets um, to some extent. But this was a specific decision uh, to temporarily uh, lift this. Um, for these kind of products. The, the issue now, I think, for the EU is the fact that the for Poland, Poland has been one of the strongest supporters of Ukraine since this war started. Um, in the early days of the war, Poland and the Baltic countries uh, were the ones sounding the alarm to some of the more Western countries saying, look, this is serious. Uh, this war may happen in Ukraine and the West needs to be aware of that. And then once the war started, Poland was very supportive of Ukraine. So the very fact that it's now Poland, that we see these uh, protests happening in Poland against Ukrainian imports and agriculture, is a worrying sign, I think, that support for Ukraine is not as steady maybe as it was at the beginning right. of the war across Europe. Right. Uh, so I think that's a really concern for, your, for the European Union. Well, that's the precise point I wanted to pick up with you, staying with you, Suzanne, uh, is that, I mean, it's hard to deny that there has been a sluggish response by the EU to these issues. P 
possibly because they feel they have their hands tied by governments within the EU, as you say, uh, feeling possibly less inclined towards Ukraine than they did two years ago. What does this tell us about the state of feeling among EU members towards Ukraine? And what does it tell us specifically about the risk of a spillover into anti-Ukraine sentiment or anti-support of Ukraine sentiment among publics within the bloc? Yeah. So at the moment, I mean, I think it, there is no doubt that it's a difficult time for Ukraine in this war. There's a stalemate with Russia and there's a real fear now that particularly after the Russian elections that uh, Putin will send in, you know, way more and more troops uh, to the front line. And this is bad news for Ukraine in terms of the the military situation on the ground. And obviously, aid is stalled coming from the United States. Now, the EU has done a lot. It's, it's agreed the 50 billion euro aid package for Ukraine recently. Countries like Germany have really turned around and are um, giving a huge amount of military aid now to uh, to Ukraine, even though in Germany's case, it's still resisting given these terrorist missiles that Ukraine said it, it desperately needs. And I mean, polls are showing that, you know, overall Europeans are still uh, very supportive of Ukraine. They want Ukraine to win this war. However, I think what's interesting about this agricultural import issue is that this is revealing what would happen potentially if Ukraine was ever to join the EU? And that's really where the rubber hits the road here. Um, you know, it's easier for Western European countries to support Ukraine when they feel it's not their problem. If Ukraine was to join the EU, well, then we could have this issue where you've got this huge country with a huge agricultural market now becoming part of the European Union. And I think that's an issue uh, for which a lot is, of countries. Which is perhaps why, ahead of June parliamentary elections in the EU, the uh, issue of accession has been parked for now. Uh, Alexandra Rubinska, I want to ask you about, as this sort of sentiment evolves within Poland, worth remembering that Poland has taken in, well, millions of refugees since the war began, around a million and a half have actually settled there. Is there a risk of their situation inside Poland becoming untenable? I don't think the situation will become untenable, but for the current government, which has been in power only since December 13th, so I can remember for a very short period of time, it's a coalition government. There are nine parties in this, in this government which have very different political programs. So um, what keeps them together is uh, the will for, for some kind of political change. But how long it will last, nobody knows. Um, and you have two peasant parties in this coalition. So two peasant parties, and you have uh, an electoral marathon in Poland that is coming up. We have regional elections in April, we have European elections in June, and then we have presidential elections. And especially in the regional elections, well, they are fought out uh, in the countryside. And this is where the two peasant parties that are in the government coalition actually get their votes from. So this is a very contentious issue, therefore. And I think what the government is trying to do is trying to find a balance between helping Ukraine and at the same time satisfying the needs of voters. Now, Polish farmers, um, they make 2% of the GDP, and uh, they're part of the electorate, the quite large part. It's 20% mm. of people uh, in Poland somehow working in the agricultural sector. So this is the difficulty that you have uh, political issues inside of countries. So there's a reason why the Ukraine cannot change its stance mm -hmm. on this agricultural issue, because for Ukraine, I think I read it's 11% of the GDP, um, so it's equally important. That's why I don't believe the solution will be found soon. And we have seen on both sides, uh, Donald Tusk didn't want Mr. Zelensky to come and discuss this issue on the 24th of February. Now, Mr. Zelensky, what I've heard, has disinvited the Polish president. Um, these are all, we can see that this is actually becoming uh, more and more contentious. Polish farms are very small. Um, Ukrainian farms are huge. So um, all this creates some kind of distortion of competition. Sorry to interrupt there, but talking about this balancing of interests, these balances are having to be uh, weighed on both sides of the border. Timofey Milovanov, take us into the thinking in the Ukrainian political mind. President Zelensky, outraged he was at the sight of U Ukrainian grain being spilt on roadsides and 
rail sides by Polish farmers. He called it a mockery of Ukraine. He's got to walk a very delicate line, hasn't he, President Zelensky, between trying to keep these markets open uh, for revenue to be generated to be able to pay for the war and at the same time not alienating his nearest, his closest allies by undermining or dismissing the con concerns of their constituents. Yes, absolutely. So President Zelensky and Ukraine uh, is extremely grateful to the Polish people for support. And this support is felt strongly. I recently was traveling through Poland, and it is there. People are supportive of Ukraine. Um, I think the situation with farmers is indeed unfortunate. One aspect of this is indeed that Ukrainian farmers in the shorter or the longer run are more competitive because they have more investment in capital historically, and uh, they simply bring uh, uh, sometimes better quality or the same quality, but definitely their cost curve is lower. Now, in principle, this benefits consumers, in particular in Poland, too, uh, having more competition. And, uh, but it is hurting, of course, the producers uh, in Poland. So that's a typical, very classic uh, example of political uh, tension within any country where local producers are more consolidated than consumers and therefore they have more political say. Now, Ukraine doesn't want to get into this at all. So we don't want to in any way make it more difficult uh, to figure out political compromises either within the EU or within Poland or, or undermine the support uh, within uh, the EU or for Ukraine. Uh, what we want to is to find a solution uh, which could be a win-win. And my view on this, my personal as an economist, uh, is that people are looking at this as a zero-sum game where it's either Polish farmers or Ukrainian farmers. But in fact, they could invest jointly into infrastructure, they could invest jointly into storage, they could invest jointly in better production. Uh, and that requires for politicians to step above the problem and find creative solutions. In fact, what we have seen is that Ukrainian grain uh, transit through Poland has been steadily decreasing over the course of the war, exactly because of the blockades. And it, in fact, it was increasing through other countries such as Romania. And some of the EU investment and Ukrainian investment and international investments into infrastructure went, in fact, in Romania, although they could have gone into Poland. So I think we're in a very unfortunate zero-sum kind of political argument, and we have to find a way to get out of this. And now the pictures of grain being on the, uh, on the, on the ground is truly disturbing for, now, for us, because first, it brings us the memories of Holodomor in the 30s, uh, last century, when Russia right. starved us. And second, we know how we earned this grain under missiles and attacks. So people die. It's really, it's really insulting. So it's, it's really unfortunate. I, I'm going to park that issue of the Holodomor until the end of our discussion because I wanted to talk about the resonances of history at the end. But just picking up on this idea of a zero-sum political calculation happening, Suzanne Lynch, you report from the heart of the EU in Brussels. Uh, there is this parliamentary election coming up in June. Uh, there is concern about far-right far uh, groups piggybacking off these farmer protests and growing sentiment against Ukraine and the war. Is it the case that Ukraine is essentially now taking back seat uh, in EU politics ahead of that parliamentary election and that it will suffer as a result of local politics concerns to do with the far right? I think undoubtedly the June European Parliament elections are weighing on everything here in Brussels at the moment. And I think this is the reason why there is a newfound caution uh, from the European Commission, from the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, about how quickly to move forward with the next steps uh, for Ukraine joining the EU. Now, EU leaders did agree to, you know, give the green light to Ukraine to join the EU, even though everyone knows this will and for every country takes years um, but there seems to be a sense now that this is going to slow down that at least uh, even though they're going to come forward with some proposals in the next month or so that any big decision by EU leaders will be made after the elections because quite frankly they're worried about stoking any kind of an anti-EU vote in these elections 
Polls are already showing that across the continent, we could see a surge in support for right-wing, far-right parties. Um, we are seeing farmers protesting, not just in Poland, but all over Europe, from Rome to Paris to here in Brussels. We've seen um, a lot of very kind of violent uh, protests here at the heart of the EU, with farmers annoyed, not just about imports into the EU, but also the EU's green climate policies mm. that they say are unfairly targeting them. So all of this is adding to a sense of anger from some parts of the electorate before the June elections. So I don't think they're going to want to move forward in a significant way with Ukraine's membership bid uh, for the EU before those elections are out of the way. Yet yeah, time, time, time is something that Ukraine just doesn't have at the moment, Timofey Milovanov. Uh, one imagines that with all of this going on, it's going down extremely well in the Kremlin. Yeah, so, so I think Kremlin is, is, is happy every time there is some argument within the EU or between the EU country and Ukraine. Uh, the Kremlin benefits from that. They are excited about this. So I think we have to be very, very careful. We have to be above this. Uh, decision makers, experts, media, politicians, it's our responsibility to understand what the Kremlin is actually doing in Eastern Europe. And if Ukraine falls, there will be not one million refugees in Poland, but would be ten. And uh, Russia will not stop. I, I'm not sure it will actually try to take on NATO, but it definitely will continue to polarize and undermine the European Union as a project. So in that sense, um, this is an example where inadvertently the way the politicians and political system works benefits Kremlin. And it, uh, it, I, I want to make it very clear. It doesn't mean there is anyone on the part of the protesters or anyone who is actually consciously doing something, but we have to be careful and work more on unification and mobilization and finding the ways to win-win rather than fight within each other. That's exactly what Kremlin wants. Alexandra Rubinska, taking on this idea that this plays into Putin's narrative, Putin's hand, Putin's idea that time is on his side, that it is only a matter of time before cracks in European solidarity see uh, Poland joining countries like Hungary and Slovakia in taking a distinctly anti-Ukraine stand? Well, as we have seen, uh, the Hungarian resistance can be broken and uh, has been broken, so I think uh, Hungary is not really the issue here. I think the issue here is that um, the war has a cost. Um, and from the beginning, that was very clear that this is going to be costly. Um, for Ukraine especially, firstly, but then also for the whole coalition that supports Ukraine. And when we see it, um, we had to change the way we uh, provision our countries with, with natural resources, with gas. All of this have cost a lot. And there's a natural process of, you know, being tired, of starting to be a little bit worn out with all the help that has to be delivered. And you can see that very often also partisan issues uh, come into play, like in the US, where the Republicans have connected uh, the issue of help for Ukraine with solving the border crisis, the crisis on the border with Mexico. So um, there's always political and partisan games coming into play. And then there's also the fact um, that Europe really wasn't prepared for this war. Western Europe wasn't prepared for this war. And it turned out that it doesn't have the capacity to deliver weapons and ammunition in the amounts that are necessary. It would have to restructure it's defense industry. But these things take time, years and years. So before that happens, years will pass. So all of these issues have come together. And of course, countries are looking at costs because they're looking at their electorates. Um, yeah. And they're looking at people complaining, inflation, rising prices, and so on. So all mm. of this is coming into play. But it's very important, in my opinion, um, that Ukraine receives the help it needs and the weapons it needs now. Um, because if it does, then the war will be over sooner and Ukraine okay. will win. Okay. And I think this is something we have to underline instead of I, just I, talking about it. Indeed. Just let's I, do it. I, I want to begin to wrap up our discussion by bringing us back to where we began, to angry farmers in Europe, to blockading the border uh, with Ukraine, spilling tons of Ukrainian grain on the roadside. Timofey Milovanov, you touched on it there. I wanted to ask you about Ukrainian commentators talking about how those images trigger memories of the Holodomor, the Stalin-era uh, forced famine 
that led to the starvation of millions of people. This is incredibly potent rhetoric. Do you support it? Do you stand by these appeals to history? Well, so the problem with these appeals are that they're indeed very powerful and they resonate with people, but they can go either way. So is it that we are upset at Poland that they are doing something to us? Or is it that the cause of all of this, of these concerns, of these conflicts, of these frictions, is actually the Kremlin again? And I think that's the later. And so we have to remember that, indeed, even in my mind, I get a very compelling mental picture of people starving in Ukraine. And even now, we have 40%, uh, according to some estimates, 20%, according to some other estimates, under poverty line. People are dying every day. People are starving. And we actually have to export some of our goods, some of our produce, because we need money. And we need this money to buy weapons so that we can defend ourselves. And, you know, it's, yeah, I, I want to control myself because it's really, really real. It's real. We are dying. You know, it's real. And so, you know, when we got a caught in the politics and we can't move this past zero sum uh, mentality where we cannot build win win. Uh, environments, this is just, you know, this is just, it's costing lives. It's on our side, of course, and no one owes us. No, not a dollar of support, not a, a bullet of support, but we are very grateful for this support. And maybe in the centuries, for the first time, Ukraine has a chance to defend itself. But you're right, these images uh, remind us what Russia has done to us okay. and continues to do. Tim, Timofey, thank you. Alexandra Rubinska, a final note on history. These borderlands between Ukraine and Poland that since the war began have been a superhighway for refugees going one way, weapons going the other. Back in the 1940s, these were killing lands. Bloodbaths happened there between nationalist Ukrainians and Poles who died in the tens of thousands. Uh, given that history, or at least a very subjective notion of history, is at the very base of this entire war, uh, it feels as if these are tensions that urgently need to be resolved. Would you agree? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to go back to the history of, of the Bohemia massacre because we are very divided on this issue in Poland and Ukraine, how to, how to uh, treat this. Um, so I think well, let's leave it out for, for now. now the whole of was, of course, a terrible massacre which, which, which happened in communist times and, and Russia was, of course, the source uh, use of Stalin. But um, so for us, of course, also we, is associated with very uh, you know, strong images. But I think... Um, I think mistakes have been made on both sides. I think that sometimes also the rhetoric that is coming from the Ukrainian side, uh, every time something doesn't go to plan and uh, Poland doesn't react the way maybe Ukraine thinks it should, um, to say that we are useful idiots for Russia um, is sometimes a little bit okay. hurtful. Um, so I think this is also something um, that I think Ukrainian diplomacy does have a few things to work on, in okay. my opinion. And um, I think all these problems, of course, are in the end solvable, um, but it has to be a will in those sides. Well, my thanks to all of our guests, Alexander Rubinska, Timofey Milovanov and Suzanne Lynch. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Jonah Hull and the whole team here, goodbye for now.